Well, hello, everyone. We are back for yet another episode of That Weems Guy, and joining us today are DB and Brian with the Y. Uh, DB, say hello to everybody. Good morning. Right? Or or afternoon, whatever. Good, af- <laughs> good afternoon, y'all. <laughs> yeah. Uh, DB and Brian are both in Oklahoma at present, and they are dodging weather. So if they disappear in the middle of this recording, that is why. That is why. And, uh, we're going to talk about their upcoming snub revolver event in South Carolina. But first, as Brian typically does, Brian broke the internet this week. Uh, he made a post about accuracy versus speed, and that always upsets the speed people. Uh, Brian, explain your post. Well, that was born out of a conversation that Daryl and I had on the way back from Amarillo. I did a marksmanship workup for about four and a half five hours with a group of people and didn't use a timer until like day two um it, or later on in the day when we were mainly shooting part-time exercises so one of the things i a few years ago i just i quit introducing new students to a timer just right out of the gate um i would use a whistle or some other command And what I discovered was most of the people that were in my classes, by the time they got to the point that they could hold a, like a B8, hold the black of a B8 pretty regularly, it was time to move into like decision-making thinking behind the gun. So that's kind of what the, the premise of it was, was, you know, I think we get really obsessed with the little blue box and a lot of the students we teach get no, no real value from it until they hit a level of proficiency that they're probably good enough to start thinking behind the gun. Right. So it it wasn't disparaging timers or anything or, or their usefulness at all. I just really backed away from making the timer. I I'm trying to use it at, Tim Chandler actually made a really good quote. He said, you know, this, the timer is a great servant and a terrible master. So I've, I lend more towards part-time exercises anyway, um, as opposed to just chasing pure speed. And I see a lot of people willing to sacrifice accuracy at the altar of speed. And I don't necessarily think that's a great thing for, the types of people that show up to classes like Daryl and I might do. Right. So that's what it was born out of. And then of course, Caleb getting saw it and he was like, put that public so I can hurt feelings. And then it just digressed (laughs) from there, you know, but, uh, but really it was like, it, it was nothing more than, you know, once we get a student to where they can hold the black of a B8 pretty, pretty much with monotonous regularity, we start to make them think behind the gun. And I think it was John Holshin that said, you know, at a certain point you shoot good enough. And to me, that's like, if you can hold the black of a B eight from 15 yards and in, it's time to start making decisions as opposed to focusing on things that maybe in the grand scheme of things, aren't all of that important split times and things like that. Right. And then once you get, beyond that yeah the timer becomes a really good tool but you know the bulk of the american gun-toting populace will never really spend the time to achieve that degree of uh proficiency so just so everybody understands terms would you explain what a part-time is oh just a set standard time has a start and a stop and a and a you know a, a certain window of time that you need to perform an action and can I, can I, can I check in on that William? Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I found for force training and training people who are going to be using a firearm on uh, some sort of force, uh, continuum. Uh, I like to constrain by the timer, if that makes sense, which is what he's talking about with part times. I like to constrain and build, use that timer to build a, uh, a fence that you got to kind of stay in, but most of the shooting sports 
are goal driven towards the time goal rather than a time fence, if that makes sense. And I find that if you want to get really good at that stuff, you have to start cutting out all the things that are important to what we do. Um, you know, the best way to start cleaning some time is stop doing follow through on a single target. You know, just stop doing follow through and that will improve greatly on multiple target engagements. The problem is, is all of the assessment we do after a shot on whether we get to shoot again constitutionally is inside of that, uh, you know, is in that follow through. Yeah, that's part of how we do follow through. It's not just resetting the gun for the shot, it's resetting the problem and making sure lethal force. So there's all of these things that to be a really good shooter in a discipline that requires time goals or 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 hit and time goals uh you kind of eliminate out of the world that we're in and i like i said i just find that if you uh are working with a timer for constraints yeah i think you're in a better place for building consistency and building a subconscious internal clock um which i found very successful on training the people i've trained who have performed fabulous in the field and I didn't invent it. I stole it from other people who all of their people did real well in the field um, on making good force decisions and then hitting and ending fights and minimum number of rounds. And all of them use timers to constrain, not to, um, not to judge efficiency. And, you know, and then it's sort of a performance thing, but we, we tend to really like using them as a constrainment. Like you got X number amount of time to do this in, and you'll probably pick up more accuracy if you use all the time rather than a lot less time where a lot of people are driven by if they can do it faster, somehow that's better. And I just find that when I get people out, when we start introducing problem solving and decision making to that, um, all that extra time you're getting isn't translating the way people think it does. And I think we need to make very clear here that we're not talking about the abandonment of time and i think that's <laughs> what upsets the people so much when you say you know we're not doing it for on the timer is we're not measuring the split speed we're not measuring how fast you got it done per se is you guys are saying we're going to give you this time envelope in which to perform this as long as you perform it within that envelope you're good and I think that's what gets lost and what upsets the people so much. They all they're hearing is no timer. Timer bad. And that's not the case at all. We typically we'll use them as a diagnostic tool. Uh if we're not using part times as a diagnostic tool to see, you know, diagnose a target and I can go back and scroll the times and go, okay, you got on the trigger really fast on these two, you know, or or whatever the case may be. Uh, Daryl and I have shot long enough and shot together long enough that I can tell by the pace he's shooting if it's get if it's gonna be a there's gonna be a wild shot out there. And he can do the same on mine. Um, he watched me shoot a test and he goes, Yeah, two of those are gonna be high because you really got on it before the gun settled. And then I look back at the timer and go, Yeah, I shot two two splits twice in a row and I had two two shots high out of the black. Um, but most of the people we train never apply themselves to that level of, of uh, proficiency. Right. Um, most people just want to go to Walmart. Right. <laughs> like, like most people <laughs> want to get gas, right? Like they don't <laughs> run in a split time. They're like split what, <laughs> like, you know? And uh that just seems to be the bulk of the students that, uh, that, that we primarily teach. And it's, um, you know, the gig we teach in Amarillo, there's a base of students there that train pretty regularly. And most of them don't get to the level of, Oh, did I shoot a one six or a one seven split? That's never part of their equation. Um, but most of them now are at the point that they can walk through a decision-making course of fire and perform it pretty, pretty well. So, you know, and I, I know the tone of that post made it sound like I hate timers and I don't, I mean, I carry one in my range bag. I just, I just don't find that 
the students that I have pretty regularly really need them that much, if that makes sense. I really don't. It, it, it doesn't have a whole lot of bearing over the way they train. So, you, you know, the other thing, Lee, is how many really good assessment drills have we ruined by chasing a time with it? Oh, the prime yeah, example the, is fair, Drew. Yeah, well, here, well, being that's one of my favorites, I'll, I'll give you that. That's, um, so I will generally at five yards shoot a one six four to a one six seven failure drill from a ready. That's my time. Uh, my guys were required to do that um, at five yards and two point five seconds. So I'm significantly ahead of what my guys were, um, and that, that was that, their const- that, that's two from point- ready. From ready. That's a 2.5 from ready failure drill. That was their constraint, if that makes sense. Um, so I generally can do that. Now, have I gotten myself down in the 120s and fast? Yeah, sure. But I can't do 120s. And at 164 once to 167, I don't even need to look at the target. I know I'm going to have two, like, center sternum and one pretty well caked in the head. I mean, it, it's that's just where I'm at. And that's how I use it. I'm not chasing. Now, the only reason I know I can do those in 120 is because I've done it, but I also know I can't do that at where I want to be. Plus I'm shooting faster than what the failure drill is designed, which is you fire that initial pair sink them and then if the head's still there you take it that's sort of the whole force justification well if i'm shooting it splits faster than i can stop the gun if the first if i'm not seeing a reaction off those initial shots because what i'm doing especially in the close range is at three yards where it's an accelerated pair i'm not even getting a second sight picture because my eyes are going to that head to see what it's doing you know, again, and then what we like doing is what we call a split fail, which is two on one target head on an, on a target next to it, which we're really not simulating it, doing it on two targets. You're simulating the shooting a moves. target and the guy moves, you know, which is going to happen in the real yeah. world. So we try to adapt this to stuff and then, but nobody wants to talk about that. I could talk all day long on my, all my 2.5 guys that everybody would laugh at. You know what all those guys did in the real world when they got in shootings? Put deck, put deck dudes, down. put deck dudes for good in less than those times with no extra rounds being out there and solving all your police problems in under three rounds. Wouldn't that be nice if everybody did that? We never chase the faster; we chase the the hundred percent and the assessment speed. And again, you give that to the rest of the world, and all they want to do is I can shoot it faster than you. And, you know, it's kind of, you know, um, it, you kind of just sit there and go, is that what we really want? Um, the fast drill uh, or the fast test. I've shot it three times in my life. Once when it came out, twice in Langdon classes, that is it. I shoot it in low sixes. I don't care because I don't practice it because I told Todd to his face, I think this is sucks it goes against everything we teach. You're going to the head right out of the gate. You're going to the head with a pair, which we never teach where then you're going back to a body with another, it's nothing we would ever teach as a force drill. That's supposed to be sort of a manipulation speed test. Well, if you shoot that all the time to attain whatever it is you're trying to attain, you know what you just hardwired into your system that you, you, that's the speed you're shooting, the order you're shooting, all the things are now, you know, uh, or, you know, nerves that fire together, wire together. It's not muscle memory. You are developing a neuro pathway cheat code that might not be the cheat code I want to put in on a neuro pathway. The cheat code I want are those failure drills. And, you know, the, the casino drill, how many people, you know, if you shoot a sub 21 casino drill, you can shoot. It, it's that simple. It's a great assessment for that or the uh five five yard five rounds into a playing card those are great little assessment drills to where you are or where you should be at a certain level but what are we all now doing 
well, I can do it in 3.2 seconds. Well, I can do it in 3.14. I can do it in, uh, okay, if that's what you want to do, it doesn't have a lot of bearing in the real world. If that was what, think, what you think makes you the gunfighter, knock yourself out at this point, because I'll tell you what, it don't. <laughs> you know, it really doesn't. You're just wiring up a path of you're just spending a lot of time on neuropathway development that is nothing like what you're ever going to use for what you say it is. Now, if you're a sport technical shooter, knock yourself out because that's working problems. That's problem solving in USPSA world or one of the competitive shooting sports. That is problem solving in your world. That is not problem solving in my world. And we don't use hit factors. <laughs> it's this and this. That's that's our that you know everybody's all well you know it's for the target that if, like I said my my last shooting I went from a full facing you know hundred percent straight on shot to a completely sideways turn by the time the trigger got pressed to now my target but you know what my target stayed the same it was this big. And, you know, so you, you try to explain this. Nobody wants to listen. You're like, okay. And then Brian breaks the internet and it's all good. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times back when I dabbled in that APA, a shooter would get done with a stage and then holster up and they would immediately ask, what's my time? Without ever even looking to see what their shots on targets were. They want to know how fast they did it in, not did they get all their hits. And that's one of the reasons why I eventually gave it up. Uh, I started chasing that. Yeah. And that was me, went, that was me at 22. What was my time? Well, you got three misses. <laughs> what does it matter, right? I went from usually being one of the more accurate shooters in a match and never hitting a non-threat to pushing speeds and seeing my, you know, position in the rankings <laughs> climb, but starting to drop more points and occasionally hitting an on threat. It's like, I'm, I'm, I'm practicing the wrong things here because the matches were my practice. And I was like, no, nah, I, I, I got to give this up. I'm starting to do this, do this, the wrong stuff. And, you know, you were talking earlier, Daryl, you talked about, you know, uh, follow through. When you hear people talking about fire that second shot and float the gun using the recoil to the next target and all that kind of stuff. Okay, what if that guy's not done yet? You know, the, the guy yeah, that you're or, shooting. Or, or the one next to him doesn't need to be shot yet. Even right. And you know, it's funny. I go out with George Mandy's and do that stuff with him because yeah. it's good for you to do. I mean, I go out with George and we do all of this pretty Pretty good technical floating guns between because I should know how to do it. But it's not what I concentrate on. And, you know, my my moment, I can tell you right now when I stopped shooting competitively, is when I left cover, you know, left a cover, not even left cover, and I'm running across a field doing a reload on the run to go run to another thing to start shooting. You know, and I'm like, that's it. I got to quit because I did it without thinking about it. Yeah. And that, you know, to, and I said, you know, when I'm subconsciously just leaving cover, you know, because I get more points and it's faster uh, to do it with a, with a gun that's no worky, there's no ammo in it. And I'm out in the middle of, you know, a field surrounded by enemies, <laughs> you know, paper enemies. And I go, and I just did that without a thought in my mind. I go, I have wired my system poorly. Then that's when I stopped shooting that stuff. I used to actually be pretty good at, you know, at that age. And then that's when I really started taking a lot of classes. It's got, I mean, I didn't stop going for training. I just spent a lot of time at ITTS every weekend instead of shooting matches. You know, it was what it was, you know. I gave up shooting the matches. And again, the matches were my practice. I didn't spend time in between matches trying to get better at different things other than doing dry work. All my life fire was going to a local club match or whatever. And I know that's not the way to get really good at that. Uh, but that's all the time and resources I had. And I gave that up and started doing the, you know, 
various guys on the open enrollment circuit. And it's amazing how much more consistent I got and how much more I could, I could start to learn to do things with the gun that I was never able to learn to do when I was getting better at the matches. And I just, a couple of years ago when I adopted the, the optic on the pistol and I said, you know, I need to go shoot some stuff that I'm not setting up. So I went to a couple of club level IDPA matches and I was so friggin' bored. You know, wait 20 minutes to shoot 10, 15 seconds to wait another 20 minutes to shoot another 10, 15 seconds. You know, of course you got pace targets to run jaw jack a little bit versus where you were in a class, you got all the mental stimulation of what's being taught, all the processing, everything that's going on. It's like, yeah, I, I, I get the appeal to this for some people and I'm not trashing it for them. Uh, but for me, I'd much rather be in the other environment. And yeah, that's where we're at. I know Brian's on board with this. We're not trying to kill, buzz kill your game. Do your game. That's just not our game, you know? And it is what it is. You know, that's just where we're at. And, you know, the more that, that class we just taught in Amarillo was a daily carry NPE type, you know, going to work in an environment that maybe has isn't gun friendly. And we taught all, all little guns, you know, like literally actually P365s is what I shot with no optic, no extended mag, no nothing. A 10 round 365 or, you know, obviously we had a lot of Glock, you know, 43s, 42 stuff like it, you know, little guns that people actually carry and had them work with it. And then working those on B8s is not easy. And again, how much timer work do you need to do versus how much, you know, really working to hold those kind of targets, you know, with the little guns with the short uh, sight radiuses and not a lot to hang on to. And yeah, it's a, it's kind of a different world. Yeah. Might- I just don't know many people that are working in an office type environment that are walking in with a Glock 34, the comp on it to tame the awesome recoil of the nine millimeter. Uh, Oh, you, know, you need to enter, everything you need, is shoved you, down the front of the you, you you need you need to internet more. Yeah, because uh, according to that, they all do. I can conceal my G thirty four with a, a extended mag and a light and a optic. It that it, it doesn't look like a colostomy bag, really. Hey, hey, my <laughs> my perspective really started to drastically change about. I mean, I've had several paradigm shifts in training and teaching and just theories of different things, but Chuck Haggard and I, we did this class last year at a conference called rule one guns. And it was just rule number one, have gun. Right. And we brought out all the stuff that we just kind of casually carry, so to speak, like normal everyday stuff. And everybody there was wearing a, you know, an, basically a mid-size or full-size service gun. And and I asked the question of every class, how many of you own one of these types of guns or, or one of these G42s, 43s, a Taurus 856, like uh, J-frame revolver, stuff like that. And everybody raised their hand. And I'm like, what do you carry every day? Oh, I carry one of those. I'm like, hmm. Oh, so well, what do you go to the range with? Oh, well, those aren't fun to shoot. So I carry one of these to the range and I'm like, Oh, maybe we're onto something here. <laughs> um, and even myself, you know, I mean, I'll carry a G 45 and a spare mag when I'm working something that there's a potential risk of, of inherent danger. But if I'm just trying to go get the mail, that's like, I throw a revolver in my pocket and there's really no excuse for me not being able to perform with that at least to an acceptable level. And that was kind of the the mission of that whole class was, Hey, you can actually carry these and here's modes of carry. And everybody there was like, yeah, that's how I carry mine. Will you ever shoot it that way or practice with it? Oh no. No, yeah, you really can't shoot those guns that well. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, maybe it's time to, um, maybe it's time to encourage a little more realism in it. You know, I'm, Trust me, I love shooting a, the G45 is my jam, but uh, I can't carry that all the time. I mean, I, you just physically can't. And um, and there's a there's a time and a place for a gun in your ankle or pocket, and there's a time and a place to train with it. 
And unfortunately, I see way less availability of times and places to train with things like that now. So, you know, I mean, even shoulder holsters, man. Like I was a dyed in the wool, don't carry a shoulder holster guy until Daryl broke me on a 36 hour road trip. And I was like, okay, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to get a couple of those when I get back. <laughs> so, um, and, and that there again, that's an example of, you don't know what you don't know until you figure out that maybe there is some validity to it. So, um, and I've decided most of the people that were coming to classes when I was teaching open enrollment pretty heavy were the guys that were trying to get that marginal, like 5% better. And now I'm really more focused on the people that are just, trying to exist in daily life with a gun, if that makes sense, you know? Um, and, and that's been a lot more, ex I've been exposed a lot more to that with Revolver Roundup, our, our private Amarillo class, and even uh, some of the conferences like not TACCON where you don't have what I would call the upper 10% of students. You've got normal earth people showing up and it really changed the way I, I look at training people. So, yeah. Well, speaking of just such an event. Uh, it, was a, it was a softball. I just pitched yeah, it. It's you. almost like you're a professional <laughs> podcaster or something. Uh, speaking of just such an event, you guys have one coming up in South Carolina in August, I think it is. August 2, 3, and 4, second will be orientation, third and fourth will be live fire training at Sawmill Training Complex. Um, really nice facility. Um, just in some of the usual suspects for names that train out there, you know, but, uh, but Daryl and I, when we started American Fighting Revolver, uh, the week we started it, the sales for the gun sight revolver roundup went live and it sold out like immediately. And, and that's a hundred students. Yeah. And he and I were, yeah. And he and I were like, we were talking about just some names that we hadn't seen around in a while. And I, and we both kind of came to the conclusion, man, we love gun sight. Gun sight's fantastic. However, if you live East of I 35, that's a two day trip a solid two day trip. So we took what Daryl and Wayne did with the original revolver roundup round Robins with four instructors. And we said, let's try to do that on the, somewhere on the East coast uh, to make it accessible to people that, you know, the weekend before Thanksgiving try the logistics of trying to get to gun site can be a bit of a challenge uh, with, without cannibalizing people from, gun site, which I thought might be a problem, except they've got a waiting list, like 30 people deep now. So I was like, okay, we're not going to, you know, cut off our nose to spite our face. If we do an event on the East coast, maybe a little earlier in the, in the year. Um, and like right now we've got 40, 41 students and we capped it at 64. So, um, I, I'm I've never done an event before a full big event like this. So it's been a lot of a learning curve, but, uh, but it's going to be a, it's going to be a great weekend and it's a great facility. So, uh, and we'd like to see that grow year over year so that, you know, the West coast revolver guys can get, get the gun sight experience and the East coast revolver guys have something. So. The other thing, uh, Lee, just to let people know, we didn't pick August on purpose. Um, no, we didn't. Yeah, I was going to make a comment uh, about South that. South Carolina. Well, I'm going to I'm going to address the concern right now. So the original date was when my daughter, the day my daughter graduated from college, which we didn't know when we originally set it. Um, and I can't miss that. That uh, that was a huge investment in a lot of different ways. So um, we tried to do a couple more dates, and the biggest problem is. Um, Chuck Haggard just got a new uh, hip Monday last week and or this week, whatever it is. And like Tuesday, yeah. Tuesday. So we really wanted to make sure we had Chuck there. And this was the kind of shortest we could do with giving Chuck enough time to recover 
um, to teach. I would rather have Chuck than not have Chuck, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Um, a lot of us teach together enough. I teach a lot with Chuck, obviously have taught a ton with Wayne over the years, teach a lot with Brian. It really helps when the instructors all kind of gel together without having to work too hard at it. And, you know, uh, Chuck and Wayne are obviously with AFR uh, between this revolver and uh, the gun sight revolver roundup and the MP class I do. They're so much part of the equation that we didn't want to lose part of what makes these classes special. And we all have, you know, we always kind of let Wayne do the marksmanship stuff because it's Wayne. And Chuck and I will usually figure out some level of um, either manipulations or deployment between us. And then Brian is so good at both uh, the one-handed stuff and the distance shooting. Um, we all have a little lane we fit in, which makes it really good for the students to round robin, is that you're not just going to let one instructor drone for a weekend you're going and you're having four people who know how to, who can all teach any aspect of this, but you are having four instructors teaching inside of a bubble that they're really good at teaching, you know, that that's really their thing of the components. So you have kind of, you're getting four highly qualified instructors, a game, if that makes sense. So, uh, like I said, the only reason we did it in August was to allow Chuck some recovery time. And um, if we do this that, again in the f future, it'll probably more be more spring than summer. <laughs> makes yeah. Sense. And the other deal was Sawmill. Uh, they do a lot of uh, .gov contract. Yeah. So this was like the only weekend that they had that was wide open and you know, and that even took some like, uh, well, we might have a contract coming that, but it's big enough that they were like, oh, well, if we do, we can shift them to this side of the facility. So, um, and who knows, we may stay there. We may, you know, we may get on their schedule earlier. It, it may, it could move to another facility. We don't, we don't know. Um, you know, the original revolver roundup started at Dallas and migrated to Gunsight. So, yeah. you know, the, but the big thing was let's make it east of I-35 in a time that's like kids are out of school, vacations, pretty healthy, great. And, um, and we're doing it two full days and just like an intro on Friday night to cover some of the admin stuff, but, um, but really get it accessible like i i think there's there's like 10 students that are from like chicago new york new jersey places that a five shot revolver is what you got and that was kind of unavailable uh to get to gun site uh you know it's just the travel logistics i mean can you imagine trying to fly out of newark with a gun and ammo and <laughs> and get to phoenix and try to you know i mean that's that's an extra day or two of travel. So, um, you know, we got a lot of guys from Georgia, South Carolina, play, names we've never seen before that just were, um, it was just prohibitive to get them out there. So uh, hopefully this event will grow and, and continue to grow and, um, and we can fluctuate it based on weather for next year. So, yeah. So yeah. I, we're going to, we're going to make the heat worth it though. We got, um, oh, yeah. we got enough. Apparently there's been a hole in the industry that needed filling because we got so much good support on from companies who've been trying to reach this kind of an audience of donations for prizes and kind of a prize table, you know, uh, raffles, whatever, uh, a lot of guns, a lot of gear. Um, it, it's going to, I think everybody's going to leave with enough stuff that uh, it should make everybody happy to come. And and the other thing we've hit on this, the way we do this is we can take from about novice all the way up to advanced and everybody will get something out of it. You know, we kind of ha know how to structure these. We've had a lot of people go, well, you know, I've never been to a big, 
class, but this is what I carry every day. Oh, you're our student. Meanwhile, we got some of these folks are like, you know, our instructors and they're like, you'll be fine too. There's, you know, this is, again, we're not chasing times and performance. We're chasing the, as you know, from doing these, you know, when you show up in some level of a training class with a revolver in a semi-auto class, it sucks for everybody. You know, it sucks for the instructor. It sucks for you as a student. It sucks for all the other students because they're constantly waiting on you. Um, you know, this way it all paces correctly. And we all have instructors who know how to run these guns. They're not faking it. Yeah. Um, you know, that's always the other problem. You know, when you're a striker instructor and that, that person shows up with a DA revolver, a lot of them are just making it up at that point, yeah. you know, which is fine, but you know, you kind of go, you know, none of the instructors here are going to be making it up. We can yeah. diagnose stuff. We can fix things. We've seen a lot of the problems. Um, we've got multiple gunsmith level people there for if we have any gun issues. So it's a lot of all those things that make an event like this desirable. If you carry any level of revolver, or just revolver curious, um, that seems to be a lot of our new student base on the revolvers, which is really kind of cool, is we're getting a lot now of striker instructors or modern gun instructors who are curious enough that they go, I may probably need to learn how to run one of these at some point. And so we're getting kind of a different student base in that we get people who are good shooters. Uh, we even at, you know, kind of those intro E instructors, you know, they've got their NRA and they're kind of dipping their toe in the instructor field. Um, we're getting a lot of those now who just are realizing that, um, I probably need to go train with some people who actually know how to run these guns and you better do it before we all die. Cause we're, yeah. most of us are getting pretty old. I mean, we got Brian's the kid and he's, you know, last, last year, Gen X or so, um, you know, get us while it's hot. Um, you know, they're, we're not going to be around forever with the guys who go, yeah, I've had, you know, I've trained, you know, where I had hundreds and hundreds of students qualify in a month on revolvers that we actually know, like when this goes wrong, what it is or how to diagnose specific problems. Let's, let's talk sponsors real quick. Cause I want to, <laughs> I was overwhelmed when I, I just sent a few kind of, Hey, we're doing an event. If you'd like to be part of it, let me know. Um, Taurus Rossi gave us a gift certificate for a, a Taurus 856 and a Rossi RP63 revolver. Um, we got another anonymous donor that's donating a brand new 642. Uh, Lipsy's has said that they are going to bring a UC revolver. And then one Wayne Dobbs is going to donate a Colt uh, Cobra with a full holster setup that we got from Galco who sent us a pile of revolver holsters. Um, we got GA arms, super snub ammo t-shirts, excess sites sent us gift cards for like 10 front sites. Um, uh, big tax, big tax <laughs> gave us two $50 gift cards, 150 rounds of, uh, American Eagle or federal gold medal match, some speed loaders, and then a whole bunch of $10 gift cards, like enough for everybody that shows up. Um, XS sent us some like notebooks and pens and uh, just some really cool like handmade swag. Uh, we got another holster vin vendor coming up, Simply Rugged Leather sending us a package. Uh, Mike Canfield over at Ransom Rest built, built a multi-cal rest, which is their, it's just like a, it's not the full contraption. It's just like a pistol rest, but it's infinitely adjustable and it's tripod adaptable. Uh, and it has American fighting revolver on the it, it lasered into it and cleaning mats. I mean, people have come out of the woodwork like, oh man, somebody's doing a revolver event. And then 511s providing instructor shirts. And I, I'm, I'm sure I'm missing so like, wilderness we still haven't even wilderness tactical yeah we uh, they'll be sending us some stuff um uh some tough strips 
yeah speed palmetto wood. weather yeah i mean there's they're they're out of the woodwork of people who really want the students to really enjoy this and get a lot out of it uh to kind of try to make this uh event like one of those destination annual events and um it, it it's going to be a ball it's going to be an absolute ball and, and and we still haven't heard from ruger but i'm thinking we might they're going to probably donate a gun too so um but yeah as soon as like i sent out an email to about 20 of our industry partners and they were all just here take a box of this a box of that i'll send you a care package we haven't even gone through it all yet. I mean, that's how much stuff they sent. And oh, we got we got ammo from High Desert, obviously. High Desert, you know, all yes, the AFR yeah. people that we normally do stuff with. Uh, so we'll yeah, there'll be a <laughs> there'll be a Bowman pocket holster, okay, maybe holster a Bowman yeah. sh- shoulder rig, and maybe some grips that are coming through the pipeline <laughs> will make it there too. So, um, yeah, it, it it started as just kind of an idea, and it just grew into a sponsor monster and. Uh, if you're on the fence about it right now we have more swag than we have participants so um you know up the ante a little bit right like <laughs> somebody's gonna leave you know with a, a a colt cobra with a galco holster a speed loader and a, and like 100 rounds of ammo so yeah we did that we're gonna we're gonna raffle that to offset all the range fees so the students aren't paying them if that makes yeah. sense, is that that way we we kept the initial tuition down to you know where you're not paying the daily range fees and stuff. So we're we're trying to do this as best we can to again make it economical and fun and you know lots of stuff for the students. Um, got a lot of people coming to help out with um, RSO and uh, that you know maintain some level of safety and, and, you know, got Bill Foster, the training coordinator and, uh, you know, bunch of stuff. So it'll be, it'll really be good. Um, and, Michael, uh, Michael's coming down. Michael Burgess is coming down from North Carolina. Uh, we were kind of like, man, there's only four of us going and we're going to have a whole lot of stuff. And I called my Cole called Michael and said, Hey, what are you doing on that weekend? And he goes, I'm taking off coming down there. Help you guys. So (laughs) (laughs) yeah. Which gives us a, which gives us a Ruger guy. I mean, part of the events, um, last part of the day, we're going to be splitting the class and then rotating them for doing, uh, Chuck and I are going to do, uh, gel stuff with a variety of loads. And then, Wayne, Brian, and Michael Burgess are going to do a whole class on on sort of basic revolver cleaning and maintenance. So again, you've got guys who had real good experience at that. Um, and you know, having Michael there really helps. Uh, he's getting exceptionally good on the Rugers. Um, Brian is is you know we don't like to talk about it because I don't want him to run off and be a gunsmith, but uh, <laughs> Brian does a great job on the Smiths. Uh, Obviously, Wayne was an instructor, uh, armor instructor for Colt for quite a while. But, you know, you got a bunch of guys uh, who can really teach you how to get the guns clean, maintain what to take off, what not to, how to, you know, screws and stuff. And then Chuck and I will be doing all the ballistic stuff with the gel. So uh, that'll be the last part of the day on Sunday. And then the rest will all be rotational. Uh, all of us sort of teaching inside of our our bubble so it's going to be a good time uh on top of michael burgess uh chuck is bringing nick deem down with him uh to ai and rso and help him out um i'm going to have my wife melanie there with me and then uh brian will have michael with them and uh dobbs will have foster so we've all got you know rso's assigned to us and the whole thing so it'll all be good and yeah. yes, we will have shade tents. <laughs> I have round, I'm, I'm in the water. process of rounding them up. And I got another call in with Sawmill. Apparently they have an ice machine and igloo jugs. So we will be good. I, um, I got to tell you, when, when I saw the announcement for this, I had kind of mixed emotions because <laughs> as you said, you know, east to I-35, the Atlanta airport with 100% perfect traffic for me is an hour and 30 from my house. Sawmill is two hours from my house. And so like I could buy that same amount of time I could drive to get to the airport to fly, to get to gun site. I can get to this event. And it was like, it's in 
August. I know what the weather here is like in August. Um, I went to basic training June, July, and August of of ninety eight. Yeah. I, I get it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but you know and, the the and, beauty of, the beauty of revolver classes, particularly how we do them, is you know we are not going to beat you up on the range. Yeah. I mean, this is not going to be get out there. We're going to be shooting for the next two hours straight. Bring lots of yeah. bring ten loaded magazines. This is going to be go back get some more ammo, get a drink, get some shade. Yeah. If we have, you know, all of us know because we're going to be as sucking in the heat as everybody. So yeah. it's going to be if we're talk if we're talking, it's going to be under shade and uh, with uh, yeah. water available. So we'll, we'll we'll make it as as best we can with the weather conditions. We're not going to hurt anybody. Yeah. So yeah, I had hand surgery on Thursday, and my hold up. The only reason I haven't signed up for the event because I knew I was having this surgery. And I want to make sure that I'm recovered enough that I could, I could shoot and, and enjoy it. You got had, two hands, buddy. Yeah. I mean, it's called yeah, a hand gun. It's called a hand gun. It, it, you know, <laughs> I, I had the same surgery two years ago. I had, and I had it in the third week of August and it was December before I could shoot comfortably again. And so we're looking at about the same, you know, layoff between this surgery and that surgery uh in that event um so i'm 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 probably going to be signing up to come but i you know i got to make sure that i'm okay and that i can do it but I, i'm well, looking forward to it for you know for the for the one thing is i can get up and drive over on saturday morning it's close enough right yeah versus well, you know flying and, in the day before and everything else and right now you got a one in eight chance of winning a a gun yeah. So there's that. <laughs> there's um, that. Um, We're gonna speak- have an epic prize table. So. <laughs> Speaking of the of the guns, uh, the you know the ultimate carry revolver was the big thing this year, uh, and then the gun market. And I did manage to get one of the six thirty twos, and I fired the first shot through it in a Claude one revolver class uh, here about a month ago, and I've interacted with Claude. For almost 15 years this is the first time yeah. i've ever had a chance to take a live fire uh clash from him and so i I've, he was running his his revolver class here locally and i managed to get into it looks like the first shot i fired through that you see was on the line in his class and i was extremely pleased with that little gun uh, i was making shots out to 15 yards keeping it in a very acceptable uh uh target window with that little gun uh, y'all really nailed it with with that design. Yeah, it's uh, and we got, which will lead us into something else. We got some other stuff coming. So, um, we obviously uh, partnered up with Josh Bowman, who I have been using Josh's leather professionally. When I started heavy in the executive protection world, I wore almost exclusively Josh's stuff. I mean, that was that is very expensive, highly professional grade stuff and then he disappeared to go off to make dot gov things uh for all those places <laughs> you know when you leave the world full time to be making leather for mm-hmm. those folks that's pretty good and um so we got together with Josh I uh, got his uh Kydex pocket holster adapted to work with the UC with the rear sight and the whole thing which were we basically eat all of Josh's production on those um so we've got them coming in as fast as he can make them and selling them. The other thing is we're working, we've been working on a grip project. Um, we just finished up final prototyping. So we're basically there and these grips are pretty much, they'll go on any centennial type J frame, but they were really developed specifically for the UC um, that I think is going to change that gun even more in the positive direction between that grip makes it uh, about perfect. If that in, in my mind is the perfect daily carry snub, particularly um, we'll have the ability of both having a hook and a non hook side of the grip. So you can, if you're running, um, uh, you know, maybe a holster you don't want the hook on. Now I run hooks on my pocket holsters. I run them on my ankle rigs. I run all that because I want to have a place to put the gun post deployment. If something happens, you know what I mean? Um, 
And then I'm running a lot now without even using holsters uh, with the hook stuff. Um, I just find it for the lifestyle I'm living. Um, and then kind of looking at some concepts for how we're training people. It's pretty hard to say you weren't carrying a gun when you got a holster on, um, you know, in a true non-permissive environment stuff. So um, we have the ability of hooking and not hooking the gun. We did some modifications to the hook to make it really uh, it's called a haggard shelf for a reason. We got it from Chuck on how to use it with your support hand to incorporate that. We've done a lot of stuff with it um, and a lot of prototyping work that we think these grips are going to be the bee's knees for that system. Um, and I think everybody's going to be pretty happy with the results at the end of that. So we'll have grips. Uh, we've got the pocket holsters. Right now we're selling out the pocket holsters the day we get them. Uh, just to our subscribers, it's worth the $5 a month to get onto that list first. And then we have, uh, shoulder rigs coming that I'm prototyping right now. And, um, and yeah, we're, we're coming up with our own product lines. That is stuff that we really like, and we're going to be working on some, uh, cleaning equipment, maintenance stuff as well, that that if it goes according to plan should be fairly unique in its design, but real uh, practical for anybody running one of these guns to maintain them. So, and, and we are also on the verge of inking a deal for bad Santa's beer balm. So, <laughs> yeah, it, seriously. <laughs> I kid you not. Uh, yeah. Thank you, you NRA you can 2024. Have, you can have this, yes. Um, that's my uh, my daughter who's uh, just got a degree in graphic design. Her, she has informed me my Father's Day present is doing the logo for uh, you know Bad Santa's Beard Butter. So, yep. Yeah. <laughs> but more to follow on that. Is in case your beard's a being naughty. Yeah. <laughs> now, we, all of the all of these products and the sign up for the snub roundup are at AmericanFightingRevolver.com. Yeah, on yeah. the shop link, you go to the shop page. Uh right now you got the membership link, the uh snub uh revolver roundup link, and then uh the pocket holsters, but uh that that shop link is where all this stuff will eventually land. Um which, let me uh yeah, go ahead. Let me a uh, quick plug to um, mm -hmm. uh, for the uh, pocket holsters, the DB force option from Wilderness. Mm -hmm. uh, that that holster was just modified specifically to run with the UCs with the rear sight because the rear sight was, if you sink it deep enough, can hang on the the top seam. So that was lowered uh, to adapt to that and uh, works real real well. I'm I've just finished. Uh, testing on the prototype of that so that'll be the the from wilderness the other the db force option pocket holster is now going to be set up to work with the um ucs as well so and also uh simply rugged does a leather version which i really like for a standard like 642 442 the 43c um i rode my 856s in it as 850, well for the, in the yeah. cobras all that stuff yeah and uh those are leather and they wear a little different than, than the, uh, the wilderness version, but they're still, uh, they're available. And, and, you know, I like leather for certain clothing. I like Kydex for certain clothing, just like a inside outside of the waistband standard holster. Um, I've got all of them. I use all of them for different things. So, um, the UC, uh, when that gun came out, they're, it kind of, I never thought I'd see a gun like force changes pretty quickly and in, in some stuff, but uh, that rear sight kind of changed the way that some of the gear is set up. And uh, thus far, it's been really cool. And these companies that support revolvers have been really quick to respond with, hey, the rear sight's hanging on these. Okay, we're going to make a, make this shorter, this wider, whatever. Um, the Bowman holster is good. I, I, that's kind of our main jam right now, but, uh, but we still use simply rugged wilderness. To, I mean, a, a bunch of them. So yeah, it's, it's, 
I thought I was retired. This grew into a monster. So <laughs> yeah. we like it though. You know, we're having a lot of fun because it keeps us out of the uh, rest of the tactical world. We're like, you know, in the, you know, in another room. FUDX. You know, FUDX. Yeah, it's the FUD, <laughs> FUDX guys over there doing FUDX things. And, you know, it's great. We're, uh, yeah, I'm packing right now for being on the road for the next three weeks and, getting out the coolest revolvers ever for the road trip and teaching and you know we're just having a good time with it and it, it you know then between brian and i uh breaking the internet on our opinions on stuff this keeps us out of a lot of trouble um you know with just you know a lot of the world's going a different way and we're trying to really really focus on what we call the normies who are looking for carrying a fire extinguisher gun yeah. um there's there's a lot out there for the enthusiast training addict world of the firearms community there's plenty of resources for that there is not a lot of resources for people just carrying you know everyday rule one guns uh you know who don't want to be in that world they just want to carry a gun and that's been mine and brian's focus right now now don't get us wrong i mean we're we have a lot of fanatic revolver people and a lot of the videos and stuff we do with AFR, but if nothing else with the AFR, I think we're also educating a lot of the firearms world on the real background on these guns um, and where a lot of things come from or why things are the way they are that a lot of people don't realize or understand. So um yeah, and that's, you know, that's just kind of because uh, we think it's important, especially for those at the instructor level. I, I personally think you're not really an instructor if you can't tell where things come from or understand context and history. If that stuff doesn't interest you, well, keep being a parrot and grading targets. You're doing great. But if you really, really want to truly consider yourself an instructor, you're going to need to go out and do some work at understanding the whys and the wheres and the hows of this stuff. And we give out a ton of that information. Uh, Brian and I, because we're going to be on the road, just shot several videos. And some of it, you know, even looking at it myself on what we're regurgitating out there for things that's like, you know, I bet you nobody really knows this stuff. I mean, <laughs> uh, other than our, our small circle, I mean, like about vent ribs on what they do and where they came from, you know, or or why, you know, people are going, look at the new Python and it's got this thing on top. <laughs> y- 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 do you know what that thing does or why that's there, you know, or where that or came from? Who was the you first know, to put it there? <laughs> there, Yeah. You know, so we do a lot of that stuff so that, you know, just kind of, it, it's interesting, uh, you know, from just, you know, kind of the gun nerd side, as well as, like I said, this has been a lot of the market we're after is if nothing else for the, the people who want to up their instructor game, instead of making it up, we're going to hand you the stuff on a silver platter of, um, Hey, this is what we do. It doesn't mean it has to be what you do, but you should at least understand where it came from and why it was done or, or different aspects of this stuff. So, and we're having a great time. Yeah, and there's there's been a surprising number of older folks. Um, I mean, in the like my dad's age group, I kid you not, my dad was in a class <laughs> with me at, at Revolver Roundup. He just wanted to support Junior, you know, and and he shows up and he goes, "Dude, I never thought about the scoring area on a B twenty seven. He's like, I I because I you know on the truck ride back to the HQ there. I said, well, hope you learned something. And he goes, well, I never really thought about why that, that scoring area is just not real good. (laughs) And I went, well, yeah, you know, stuff like that. And then, um, you know, one of our things with AFR is one, we want to preserve the history and the lineage of a lot of this stuff, um, which I had no idea was not commonplace and especially in the 50 plus age range like how do you 
you know, remove your yoke screw and take the cylinder off. Like I thought that was just common knowledge just because that's how I grew up. Right. Um, and you also have to tighten that thing down occasionally yes, or the cylinder do. falls off. Get well, you know, in. it's kind of like for a lot of us, you know, we don't do it anymore, but if you didn't know how to adjust the uh, idle speed or choke on a car, uh, you know what you weren't doing? You weren't driving, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. take, take any of these guys who are in the, you know, have seen nothing but a striker fired gun their entire life. And you could pose that to them. Hey, do you know how to address the idle on your carburetor? <laughs> what are you talking about? Idle and choke. Yeah. Yeah. You don't get to start the car in the morning if that ain't right. Or, or even changing a spare tire. I mean, don't you call AAA and that does it or, and I'm just as bad now, you know, light goes on and go to discount tire, you know, um, <laughs> <laughs> but I know how to do it. So, you know, we're kind of telling people about muscle cars and four speed transmissions and, you know, and uh, three on know, the tree the, and, drum three and, drum brakes and, you know, and how to, how to address just your, uh, you know, distributor for max performance using a vacuum gauge, all of these neat things that everybody should know if you're an American. <laughs> so, I, I still drive a truck with a manual transmission and manual windows. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You can leave that in most of urban America with the keys in it yeah. and they uh, couldn't start it. Yeah. But, yeah. but we want to preserve that. Um, uh, also, I mean, there's, there is a bit of a, some of it is, you know, our collection set in gun rugs and boxes and stuff like that. And, you know, it would come up in conversation. Oh, I've got one of those. No, oh, really? And now we're able to go, this is what this is. You know, this is out of my collection. This is, um, yeah, I mean, I, and I've had guns come to me that they just, they fell in my lap because somebody didn't know what the, it was. Um, yeah, I recently picked up a combat Magnum, AKA pre 19. If that sets in my closet, it'll just go back somewhere 10 years from now where nobody will know what it is. And it, you know, to be able to preserve some of that lineage and some of that history, it's as much as it is fun to, you know, set and talk about a gun and, and give that to the masses, um, the, the bigger thing is man, these are just hunks of metal unless somebody preserves the history of them so and, and we're not just doing this is the other one that that gets people we're not just doing the old stuff uh we did a profile on a wiley clap gp100 mm-hmm. why because they're cool and they're they're out there um sp101s they're they're out there uh we'll do some on lcrs and tauruses and i mean just any number of guns that uh, or revolvers specifically that some of them, you can go into the gun shop and buy them right now. It's like, but they all have a history. They all have a lineage. They all have some uh, backstory. Right. And uh, a lot of, even if, it's ba- even if it's bad, you yeah, know, even I if mean, it's some subpar, of, right. We just, uh, we just did a maintenance Monday where I did it because, you know, it was on bad guns you shouldn't buy because uh, they're not safe, you know, that are being sold right now as collector's items and some sort and of not. desirable thing. And they're not. And, you know, so we're even trying the education on stuff of uh, don't don't get roped into this. Um, so you're trying to have a little of everything. Yeah, which is I'm shocked every time I see the names on our subscriber list and I go, man wow uh there's some there's some heavy hitters in the revolve in the gun world that <laughs> subscribe to it and i get messages from them all the time oh man i i didn't realize that that's what a you know a, a dual pinned front sight meant you know stuff like that or mm-hmm. man i never even thought about that and then i pulled nine of mine out of the gun safe and realized oh yeah this is what he was talking about so so it, it, it's a lot of fun and uh yeah, the other piece of it is working with new manufacturers or working with manufacturers. And because uh, before it was just like Brian and Daryl got a good idea, you know, and now it's like, oh, the guys from American Fighting Revolver <laughs> want this or have said this is this is the way or whatever. So um, that's been a real interesting um, 
I guess, byproduct of doing something we just enjoyed doing. Um, it, it, NRA, you know. NRA for us was pretty interesting this year on seeing a massive shift in some of the corporate level of the gun world on maybe we should be talking to people who really understand this stuff um, instead of people who don't. And that was, that was a pretty interesting dynamic um, that we found uh, is maybe we are doing something really good out here is getting, you know, we all like to complain about these companies don't make what we really want or need. Uh, the problem has been they don't have the access um, to the people who actually get that stuff. So we've made some really good inroads on that. Um, I mean, the UC is a perfect example. I mean, we didn't come up with that. We just helped. Um, you know, you put you put the right combination of people together, and that's what you get. Um, and this is all about putting the right combinations of people together, um, you know, the right teams rather than, uh, you know, and some of the companies are finally understanding that, you know, uh, Lord knows Brian and I will break things, um, is that finally having a couple people out there who will tell you your baby's ugly. Um, but the biggest but make problem, you understand <laughs> why, why, I mean, we're not just being mean, we're telling you your baby's ugly and here's why versus, you know, in a corporate world, nobody wants to tell the boss or the marketing person or whatever that uh your baby's ugly but you know somebody needs to do it and people are finally starting to listen because it's like wow uh you know Lipsy's hit a home run with that smith and wesson project how did they do that well they had the right guy at Lipsy's talking to the right guy at smith and then having uh the you know Jason at Lipsy's talking to the right people to get some additional bouncing ideas off. Um, you know, that's, that's my biggest, I think, contribution to that project, convincing Jason Klausner to do a 32 H and R mag gun was not hard. Uh, Cause he's a huge fan of that cartridge and the three twenty sevens and various things that wasn't hard. What was hard, what was made it easier is somebody from my end of the world telling him that's the way to go that verifies that, okay, we've got everybody on board on this, that that is a viable, smart thing to do. And I'll, I'll tell you, I think the sweetheart of the UC series is that 32 H and R gun. Oh, yeah. I the mean, other... cause it, it, it does all the things everybody hates about snubs. Well, yeah. and we just gel shot him again uh, last weekend with Chuck, but before his surgery, and, you know, watching those 32s fall out the back of the 30, a 16 inch block of gelatin uh, solves a lot, you know, solves verifies a lot of, a lot of what problems. we're saying that, you know, these will shoot through humans just fine and not beat you to death. And you get an extra round, you know, wow, yeah. all the, all the stuff, you know. The, so, the other yes. byproduct that I would have never seen coming was the amount when I went to revolve around up 2021 as a student 38 ammo was in short supply. You couldn't find it. Uh, you know, I mean, I reloaded a bunch of ammo and then some pistol team guys felt pity and spotted me some old dot gov ammo, you know, but, um, now man, you can get on high desert. You can get on GA arms. You can get on lost rivers website. And then the major manufacturers I've seen, I haven't seen 38 ammo on shelves in a long time. And all of a sudden it's everywhere. And I went, yeah. Hmm, it sounds like they've taken a, <laughs> taken a clue here. Um, is it priced with nine millimeter yet? No, but are we starting to see it trend that way? Yes. Which is, uh, that was one of those things that when this revolver, the UC project happened, I thought, you know, 32 is a great idea, but man, ammo is just scarce. And all of a sudden, man, ammo is like coming on strong. And now we're even starting to see that the, the smaller boutique ammo companies, you know, Lost River, uh, Steve up at High Desert. Hey, you guys want a 357 that's not super hot? Hey, you guys want a 32? You want a 
32 long load in a 32 H and R <laughs> maybe a little, a little hotter, but not, you know, <laughs> rip your hand up. And it's like, now we're working with ammo companies. I got one of them. I won't mention was like, Hey, I'm, I'm, I got some 41 mag brass. I'm like, Oh wow. Now we can, we can actually resurrect that cartridge to some degree. 44 special is, is kind of coming back again. And it's like, now we're, we're in this renaissance of like, <laughs> Oh, now, now the smaller ammo companies will start to drive market to the bigger ammo companies. And, and that's been a really positive byproduct of doing some of the projects we've done. Um, there and then the other, the other, the other one is in for the big ammo companies. Hey, guess what? 30 super carry is really going to become, is going to be 32 revolver ammo. <laughs> that's going to be the the huge byproduct off of that mark my words <laughs> yeah that that 30 super carry and 327 fed mag are kind of in the same ballpark uh so now you're starting to see some of the bullet tech trickle into bull uh, up and down so that's been cool and the other one is the amount of revolvers that were in obscurity that were released 25 years ago you know in the last like last ditch effort to try to get people to buy them you know the 242 the 296 uh the 332 the 331 mm. well now it's like those guns are getting mainstream again they're starting to really pick up steam so i'm really excited to see what the next four or five years does in the revolver world so that's I was encouraged after NRA. I'd kind of gotten into this, man, nobody's ever going to listen to us and they're just going to, but man, they're, they're playing ball now. And, and that's, that's great. And I'm sorry, polymer striker fired world. I love you, but I don't know that there's anywhere it can go. It's maybe as good as it's ever been and as good as it ever will be. Um, but now we got, wheel guns and we got really really good ammo tech now so we'll see you know yeah i went to the academy in the tail end of mm -hmm. the revolver era uh, i went to a regional academy that was serviced 10 counties and then plus all the municipalities and stuff in those 10 counties and there were two agencies that were sending cadets through there that were still in wheel guns and this was 99 and so I got to see all of that get presented at the academy. And over the years, of course, I I I, I love to go sit and let's talk to the old cops and get the old stories. I've picked a lot of their brains on the revolver stuff, and I've tried to get as much firsthand information on it as I can. And it's fun to see some of this stuff coming back into the mainstream. But, you know, it's it's funny. I've seen cops that have come through like after I did. They shoot pretty good. They go to a firearms instructor school and they come out. And then the first time they ever encounter a revolver in the field, they don't know how to open the cylinder to get the rounds out. And so that's one of the things I'm doing with the baby cops now is I'm bringing in revolvers and dummy cartridges. And every cadet has to clear <laughs> out you know clear out a revolver and everything just so they know how to do that kind of stuff but uh you know daryl you made a comment earlier on about people faking it and the like revolvers is one of those things that you can't fake you gotta know no oh, they're trying though they're yeah, trying <laughs> they're... But, but, but my point is i think that intimidates a lot of them to the point that it's throw their heads oh these are bad yeah that's yeah. been the usual responses because I don't know how to shoot it and I don't know how to teach it. It must be bad. Yeah. And, you know, and, and I listen to these guys doing classes and, oh my God, all the revolvers broke or whatever, you know. And I sit there and go, you know, we put on an event every year with a zillion people there shooting these things and never seem to have these problems. We'll have one or two, but that's no different yeah. than any other big conference. But we don't have these men. I go, I, I don't understand it otherwise, other than we tell the people what to bring, what the expectations are, and shoot the guns within yeah. their, yeah. how they should be shot in a training course, you know, and because we know how to do that, and we don't end up with a lot of those problems. And, you know, it would really be easier for people to just kind of go, 
I don't really understand this. And I've seen a lot of these videos where, see, this thing's the worst thing in the world. And I go, well, I would be embarrassed as an instructor if I had a shooter doing what you have that shooter doing to prove this sucks. Um, you know, if I grab somebody who's pretty competent on a revolver, for example, and I hand them a Glock 43, not an X, just a G43, and go, go run this and here, hold it like this. It's going to be, a, I have a hard, hard time shooting those guns with my hands issues now. And most people can't shoot. I was just in the class this weekend. I mean, I watch more malfunctions in semi-automatic pistols than I know what to do because it's a small guns class. And most people don't shoot those guns real well. The one thing with the little revolvers do is they tend to go bang. Are they hard to shoot? Yeah. But they generally go bang and don't malfunction. So you're balancing this stuff out in... If you're not open-minded enough to how to balance these things out, all of these things have pluses and minuses. And we're finally I, finding now I'm laughing that, <laughs> because yeah, <we're, laughs> I thought I was going to be behind. I was shooting a 43C, 8 shot 22. I thought I was going to be holding everybody up. And I can't tell you the number of times that me and Ian Mikowski from BTO – are sitting there with loaded revolvers waiting for the next course while I'm hearing tap rack and all this hoopla going on on the other end of the line. And I'm like, he and I are looking at each other going, dude, I thought we were going to be in last place all, all day. And, uh, anyway, so yeah, yeah and I, just... I was, I, I was running a, a 22 LCR through most of it loading out of my hand. I mean, yeah. I, how I, my reloading technique, I make a little pocket under the thing. I'd, dump 22 in there and put them in by hand and was, you know, having not a whole lot of, and I'll tell you what, accuracy wise, you would have been hard pressed. Um, the work I was doing with that 22 LCR, I scared myself. Um, so yeah, these guns are, are, are good for a lot of people. And, you know, but again, you, you hit the nail on the head, Lee, if you don't understand it, uh, crap talk it. Okay. You know, that's fine. You know, um, we get accused of that a lot on the other end, but you know, again, I'll put my credentials. I guarantee I was running a red dot before about 99% of everybody else. Um, so, you know, it isn't like we don't understand this stuff. We just, we just like our place in the world with these things. You know, we're both retired now. We don't go out looking for trouble. We do appropriate stuff when we're working security jobs. Um, you know, and, but otherwise, I mean, I want to walk the dog and, you know, throw a ball in a lake and enjoy my life and go get the mail and not live a firearms lifestyle. I want to live a lifestyle and carry a firearm and these guns fit for it. And there's a lot of people just like that at this point, you know, I've been doing this for a long time as an armed professional. I really think I've earned the time in life uh, to just enjoy travel and life and living a good life, you know, minus my whole world revolving around what gun I'm carrying and my holster system and my optic and everything else, you know, it's more than I want to think about every day. I just slap a revolver on the minute I get up and I take it off when I go to bed. Yeah. Uh, I, again, I, I think that the, the little UC guns solved a lot of the, the gripes that you could have with, with the J frames and the like, sites that i can see yeah that that to me was a game changer with the thing because i've had revolver for, for forever um and quite frankly i had gotten where i didn't spend a lot of time with them because i couldn't see the sights on them anymore and then all of a sudden here's a here's a little j frame side revolver with six shots instead of five because I got the 632 and it's got sights i can see i'm in heaven i, I just and a, I, and I love and the a, thing. And and a trigger you can manage. Yeah. Right? And it doesn't <laughs> yeah. hurt to shoot. Yeah. It doesn't hurt to shoot. You can sit there all day hitting things. That yeah. was the biggest thing we saw, particularly the 440 or the 432s, 632s, that everybody loves about them. Because they're, it's like now they got a revolver with a decent trigger and great sights that they can really hit with. And it, it, it doesn't hurt every time you pull the trigger. Yeah. You just see these big smiles because people can go out, shoot, and be successful with a little gun. 
without all the problems usually of those kind of guns. I shot the whole day long in Claude's class with the 632, roughly 300 rounds of ammo. And I was fine. I was starting to get a little sore by the end of the day with a G10 grip for hand ring the, the inside of my, where my thumb joins the hand. Uh, I was shooting 32 long all day. Um, I dare say I could not have done that with my 642. Um, and you know, the, the God's yeah. honest truth in a similar size, would have you been yeah. doing that with a 43? You know, I, I don't know. I've not tried. I've uh, got a 43, but I've never put that. I mean, go, yeah, go shoot 300 rounds a day and a 43. You ain't going to be real happy either, you know? And then, yeah. you know, so, you know, it's, it's, it puts it in a viability thing. Um, you know, for a lot of people of just being a great gun to carry and that you don't mind practicing with your carry gun. You know, that's, that's, you know, that's the one thing we keep trying to get across to these people. We're not trying to talk you out of your, your, you know, master blaster 5,000 with the red dot and light and all the cool stuff. What we're trying to tell you to do is take the gun you always have on you. And because usually for me is when I leave the house, I'm usually carrying, I mean, if I get in my car and turn the key for the ignition, I probably got like a SIG 365 in my waistband. Now I still have got a air weight or an air light revolver in my pocket, but you know, I, I mean, I get it, but the reality is go shoot the guns you actually carry is what you should be spending your time on. You know, the ones that are easy to shoot, you probably don't need to spend as much time on, but they're a lot more fun to go to the range with and be successful at drills, you know. But the reality is, which one are you going to probably have with you, you know, when you stumble into some guy, you know, trying to jack you at a gas station? You know, that's the, and you know, covered low ready of that gun, hand on your gun in your pocket at the gas station is sure better than. Uh, you know, trying to pull a full appendix draw off with your Master Blaster 5000, you know, from your, you know, you know, with a draw stroke involved. So, you know, again, they're very practical, I think, for most people. Um, if we get over the, you know, I got to be able to make this score. The Internet won't, won't, you know, if I don't have this coin score Pokemon uh, accomplishment thing, I'm, I'm somehow not good. So uh, we've been going about an hour and a half. So uh, guys, uh, Brian, any closing thoughts? Yeah, man. Uh, sign up for South Carolina snub revolver roundup. Like uh, somebody just did about 10 minutes ago, Daryl. So we're up to <laughs> a solid 40 students now. Um, somebody uh, got off the fence there. Uh, but yeah, the South Carolina event, check it out at American fighting revolver.com on the shop link. We're on all the socials. We're on Rumble. I've I've kind of backed off of our YouTube account and our Rumble account because Rumble's having some growing pains right now. Um, but we do some free podcast content there. I did one with John Hearn with Rob Garrett. A couple Daryl and I did the information video for South Carolina, the sawmill uh, revolver roundup. And then check the shop link. We have got a lot of great products that are getting ready to drop. And uh, this winter is going to be busy. After we get back from Sawmill, there's there's going to be a lot of products on the website. And uh, for those of you that don't run an e-commerce website, it's a lot of work. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, retirement is working 30 hours a week instead of 40. But, uh, but yeah, we got that. And then... Uh, stay tuned. Also, there'll be an announcement on a cult event coming up on a revolver experience that Daryl and I are going to be the lead instructors for down there at Range Ready in um, Robert, Louisiana, which is just outside of Baton Rouge. Colt's going to do an event that's like a grade A, like you get a gun when you leave and breakfast and lunch and ammo and holsters, the whole shooting match. So um, they still don't have the link live for that. As soon as they do, we'll, it'll be hyperlinked on American fighting revolver.com. And then for those of you that don't want to get a subscription to American fighting revolver.com, 
check the website. We put out some free content there as well. We share some of Mike Woods articles. We got a, we got several free videos or public videos for maintenance Monday and a couple of other profile videos on guns. So you can kind of get a little taste test before you jump in, but that's, that's my final thoughts. Speaking of Mike Wood and the revolver guys webpage, they just posted an article with an interview with someone who was at the very first leather slap match, which is where the whole modern technique eventually start, you know, ultimately started. So check out revolver guy. Is it revolver guy or revolver guys? Revolverguy.com. Revolver um, yep. We love Mike. He's like part yeah. of our family. So yeah, 100% we support him. And yeah, he will be, for those of you that are lucky enough to get into the Gunsight Revolver Roundup event, he will be doing a, I think, a two or three hour debrief on the new three hall hour, shooting. Three hour debrief, two days on new hall. So it'll be great. Daryl, any final thoughts? Uh, Brian covered it. I'm not going to beat it to death. <laughs> Brian got it. Nailed it. <laughs> well, there you go. I guess my final thought is, is I hope I'm healed up in time to uh, join you guys over in South Carolina. And um, September 21st, I have the range at Cisco, Georgia, which is out near Dalton, uh, reserved. I'm going to be doing a shotgun class there, so I'll be posting the link to that soon. Um, that's the class that the, they ultimately said they wanted up there. So that's what we're going to be doing. And uh, hopefully we'll have some stuff local uh, to put out here in the fall. Um, I'm ready to get back at it. I've been in the classroom for a little over a year now doing this graduate work thing again. I have finished all the coursework, but they have not yet conferred uh, the magic piece of paper yet. So I'm not going to say that I have it. Uh, so I'm waiting for that to hit. And, um, yeah, uh, some things I picked up uh, that I'm really willing to incorporate into some live fire stuff and pass along. And uh, with that, folks, we know that your number one asset is your time. Thank you for choosing to spend it with us.